Good morning. I have a serious question for you today. Why are there so many buttons on a TV remote control? I counted all the buttons on my TV remote control the other day. Guess how many buttons it had? 44. Dan Mohan was the closest. He gets the prize. 44. I have no clue why it has 44 buttons. It seems like a waste of plastic to me because do you know how many buttons I actually need? Three. I only need three buttons. I need one button that turns the TV on and off. I need another button that changes the channel. And I need a third button that changes the volume. That's it. I need a three-button TV remote control. Do you think that they make those anywhere? <laughs> what well, TV manufacturer should give me a call then? because I have a lot of good ideas for them that could save them a whole lot of money. TV remotes, though, as complicated as they are, they aren't the only thing that we complicate in life. We complicate refrigerators. <laughs> have y'all gone to Home Depot these days and seen their... Amy and I were shopping for a refrigerator a few months ago, and we saw one that came with Wi-Fi. We could sync our phone to it. It was touch screen and it gives you the weather. I just don't need a refrigerator that tells me the weather. It's too complicated. We complicate relationships too, don't we? Have you ever had a conversation with someone else, through someone else? <laughs> like I'm talking to this person, but I have to talk to this person who talks to that person for me, and then that person talks to this person who talks to this person for me. And at some point, I'm just like, get out of the way and let me talk to that person. We do it all the time, though. We complicate life. We also complicate the church and our faith. When it comes to the church, everyone agrees and everyone knows that we need to grow. Like globally or nationally, we all know this about the church. The church needs to grow. Statistics are quick to point out that churches as a whole in our nation aren't doing so well. I feel like Trinity is doing really well really well, by the way. If you look around the nation and you read about the type of stuff that's happening in the other denominations and in other churches, we're doing really well. So nationally, it's not going so well. We all know it's true. The church needs to grow, and it needs to grow quick. But occasionally, we want it so badly that we start to complicate things. Pastors are often the most guilty <laughs> of doing that. So this is the pot calling the kettle black. We add more programs, more events, more socials, more, more, more. We make a weekly schedule so full it's about to burst at the seams and eventually we add so much that all of a sudden we have a remote control with more buttons on it than we know what to do with. But in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, Luke is quick to point out that maybe the solution isn't to add more buttons. Maybe the solution to church growth is focusing on the essential buttons, be it a few or a lot. So we're in Acts chapter 2 today, verses 42 through 47. We're continuing our series through the book of Acts. And just as a friendly reminder, this series is all about learning how to be a church on mission. Remember at the very beginning we said that there is no such thing as a non-missional church. That does not exist. There is no church out there that can choose to be non-missional. A non-missional church isn't a church. And so how do we embrace that part of our characteristic? Well, I thought the best way to do it was by studying the early church in the book of Acts, a brand new church who, who were all about that, trying to figure out how do we grow, how do we tell other people about this, how do we get other people to know 
Jesus Christ. So we're in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. The Word of God says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And get this, (laughs) and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So did you hear what they devoted themselves to? Some people would say that these are the essentials of the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. It's my favorite on the list, I think. (laughs) To the breaking of bread and to prayer. A few buttons. A few buttons, that's all. It was a small TV remote control, but apparently... It was the right buttons. Because, Luke says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So maybe the answer isn't a remote control with 44 buttons. Maybe the answer is that we need to devote ourselves to a smaller remote with the essential buttons. So the first button on that remote is devotion to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they were a learning church. They were learners. They dedicated themselves to the process of discipleship, which means, discipleship means, learning to be more like Jesus. And who better to learn that from? than the guys who walked and lived with Jesus, the apostles. You know, it's a habit we continue even to this day. When we gather here on Sunday mornings in your small groups and in this worship, we gather here to read the stories and the letters of who? The apostles. Why? So that we too can learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But now how does learning and discipleship help a church grow? Like what's the connection between being a learner and really taking seriously this call to be a disciple and church grow? Well, hopefully the things that you're learning here on Sunday morning are expressing themselves throughout your week. Right? That's the goal. That what we learn here on a Sunday morning expresses itself into your week. Discipleship is the product of two things. It's the product of orthodoxy and orthoproxy. Big words, so we put them up on the screen today. Orthodoxy and orthoproxy. Orthodoxy means simply right belief. Right belief. I hope That when you sit out there on Sunday, you are learning orthodoxy. What it is that we actually believe. But orthodoxy should always lead to orthoproxy. Orthoproxy is right practice. Right belief should lead to right doing. You see, we aren't really learning at all, if that learning doesn't actually change the way we live. That's not learning. 
at all. You know, on two separate occasions, I had the opportunity to uh, travel to Germany to help with a small Baptist church and their evangelistic efforts to their city. We did baseball camps. That was the big draw for all the German kids. Real Americans teaching real American baseball. And so kids would sign up. They'd have to turn kids away that have so many. This little bitty Baptist church. It's a really cool ministry. But I went over there and I was staying with a couple that taught and helped in the youth department. And I asked them, what is or what are the greatest challenges facing German teenagers and, and German young people today? And this is what they said. They all call themselves Christians, but they're not Christ followers. They're, they call themselves Christians, but they're not Christ followers. In other words, they, most of the kids in Germany grew up in the Lutheran or the Catholic church, and they went through catechism. You all know what catechism? Catechism is, catechism is that process of learning what we believe about the Christian faith. It's a great program. I'm really proud of those churches for putting such a big emphasis on orthodoxy. And so if you're in the Catholic Church, you grow up learning. Man, you learn it. You know what the Catholic Church and what the, the basic tenets of the Christian faith are. But the problem in Germany is that none of that learning has ever translated into any of their lives. None of them are living the way Christ wanted them to live. So they all know it. But they don't know it. That's how you produce a society of Christians that don't follow Christ. It's one thing to say... I know it here, but it's something different to say, I know it here, and it's affecting me out here. Orthodoxy should always lead to orthoproxy. You know, when a young lawyer asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, Jesus answers his question with a question, what is written in the law, Jesus asks. How do you read it? And the lawyer answers him, love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replies, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. You see, there's a difference in answering correctly and actually doing correctly. And eternal life is reserved not for those who know it, but eternal life is reserved for those who know it and do it. Yeah, so that early church, if I could... We do our best to do it. We, we do our best to say, let's just get back to the early church. I don't know if that's exactly possible, but when I try to imagine that early church setting of people gathered around and what it's like to actually sit there with Peter, Thomas, and John, you're getting to sit with these people. Here's what I imagine, that while these apostles are up there teaching and these new converts are lit, 3,000, that's what Luke says, that in one day, 3,000 brand new Christians join them. I imagine that all those 3,000 people and everybody who's added daily, I imagine that they are still asking that same question that they asked when they first heard Peter preach. Y'all remember it's in Acts 2. They asked, what shall we do? What shall we do? Are you asking that question too? Sunday to Sunday, week to week, what shall I do? It's an important question. Because learning isn't really learning unless it results in better living. And if you're actually learning to live like 
Christ, if you're actually taking that process of discipleship, becoming like Christ seriously, then others are going to be attracted to that. People are going to be attracted like, to the life like that. Like my brother Ross used to say, start a fire right where you're at and somebody will see the smoke. No one has to say, look, a fire, look, look, here's my fire. Do you see it? Do you see my fire? Nobody has to do that. The smoke is evidence enough of fire. So are you devoted? Are you devoted every day of your life to learning the way of Jesus? Don't just be a Christian. There are a lot of Christians in the world. We have a lot of Christians. Be a Christ follower. But there are a few more buttons that we need to add before this remote control is ready for production. Just a few more. The second button is devotion to fellowship. Koinonia. Koinonia is the Greek word that Luke uses. I venture to say y'all have heard the word koinonia before. Sometimes... Bible study classes name their class the Koinonia class. They do that because it's a very important word in the New Testament. Koinonia literally means sharing. That's, that's what it literally means, sharing. But it is an intimate sort of sharing. Jesus' desire was that His church would be one body united with Him at the head. One people, one family, one organism. It's what he means when he says in John 14, 20, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. It's what the author of 1 John says in Chapter 1, verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have koinonia with us and our koinonia is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It is what famed preacher John Claypool says in one of his most famous sermons. What happens to you makes a difference to me. It's a simple little phrase, isn't it? That captures the spirit of koinonia. What happens to you makes a difference to me. Koinonia is like that supernatural glue that bonds us to Jesus and to one another. It's what helps us stand together, side by side, arm in arm. It is what makes us prepare and deliver food to a family who is grieving the loss of a loved one. Or visit a sick Sunday school member in the hospital. Or say, I can... I can help cover your electric bill this month. Koinonia is sharing in all things of life and with one another because we recognize that we're just one big family. <laughs> and Jesus is our head. And the church expresses koinonia most vividly with two practices, Luke says. The Lord's Supper and prayer. I wish that the breaking of bread meant more potluck suppers. <laughs> That's what I wish it meant. Most likely, it refers to the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. The Lord's Supper, we are united in that act with Christ and with one another by sharing one loaf of bread, representing Christ's body and sharing the one cup, representing Christ's blood. That's why I like so much doing intinction. You, you know, remember on special 
times we'll have one cup and one loaf of bread and you come up and you tear a piece of bread off of it and you dip it in the cup. We do that around Christmas time. I like doing it that way. When you have a thousand little pieces of bread, it doesn't capture that other part of the Lord's Supper that we are one. One loaf, one cup, one Christ, one people. The Lord's Supper is not only a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice. It's much more than that. What it means is that right now, in this present time, we are connected to Him. And because we are connected to Him, He connects all of us together. And prayer too. Prayer is also a form of koinonia. See, in that passage, you think that it almost sounds like Luke's talking about four things. He's really talking about two things. And prayer is a part of it. In prayer, we are ushered by the Holy Spirit into God's throne room where we have the chance. Think about that. Standing in Christ in God's throne room, getting to talk and commune with them. That's what prayer is. That's why it's so important for us to be a praying church. You know, a few weeks ago we hosted a prayer event. Several members met up here and we had prayer prompts on the screen. All, all they had to do was come in and you open up a Bible and there were prayer prompts on the screen. Nobody had to pray out loud. You just followed the prompts on the screen silently. And Norm and I were talking about it and we said we should keep doing this. We should keep doing it until more and more people come and be a part of it until it grows and until we truly become a church united in prayer, a church united in koinonia. And you want to know why koinonia is so important for Christ's church? Koinonia is so important because we cannot live the way Christ has called us to live without it. We can't do any of the things Christ wants us to do without it. Fellowship. It will be the foundation that Christ's new radical community stands upon. In verses 44 through 45, Luke will talk about a community that shared all of their possessions. The believers were together and had everything in common. If someone was in need, somebody else sold something of value to provide for their brother or sister, which sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? Sounds a little too Karl Marx for our American taste. A little too communistic. Who would do that for someone they don't really know all that well? The answer is no one. Nobody. We're not going to do that for somebody we don't no, if a stranger walked up to you on the street and said, hey, I'm sick, I need a kidney, can I have one of yours? You'd most likely say, no, you can't, and get away from me before I call the police, psycho. <laughs> but what if it were someone you love? Would you give your kidney up for somebody you love? brother or sister maybe, your child, your spouse, your best friend, would you do it for somebody that you're in fellowship with? You remember Doug Cassidy, the mission guy who came and put on that conference for us? Several months in November, October, sometime. Doug Cassidy has the kidney of one of the other church members at the Woodlands First Baptist Church. J.T. Thompson, one of our best friends over there, several years ago gave up his kidney for his brother in Christ. Why? Oh, <laughs> hard to say. But I bet that Koinonia had something to do with it. It just makes sense. We share more abundantly with those we love. And we love those who we spend time with. 
if Christ's church is going to live like Christ, it's going to take that supernatural glue. It's going to take koinonia. But koinonia can't be manufactured. This is wildly important. You can't force or create community and fellowship. One of the most important things that Dr. Roger Olson, the theology professor at Truett, ever taught us is that fellowship and community, koinonia, it's not a thing. It's an event. Koinonia is something that happens. It's interesting to think about, isn't it? It is an act of the Holy Spirit that lives within and upon a community. Fellowship just happens when we're sitting around a table and eating together and talking and visiting and sharing stories with one another. Fellowship, koinonia, just happens when you're in a small group and, and you share that you're struggling with some, something in your life and somebody else in that small group utters those most holy of words, can I pray with you about that? Koinonia just happens when we laugh together and celebrate together like we will do at the end of church today with Daniel. We'll laugh and we'll celebrate with her. Koinonia will just happen. Koinonia will just happen when we work and we serve alongside one another in a flooded out home, when we gather with our brothers and sisters in holy communion, in holy work, in holy prayer, the Holy Spirit says, yes. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, these are my people. And this is my church. This is what I want them to look like. So, yes. And he gives us koinonia without trying to force any more buttons on that remote, without trying to force the button fellowship and community happen. It's an event. And you know what? Who wouldn't be attracted to a church like that? Who wouldn't want to come be a part of that? Who wouldn't enter through these doors and feel that overwhelming sense of love and community and say, wow, wow, I want to be a part of that. And yeah, that's what's happening. In this early church, Luke says, that's what's happening here. Everyone, Luke says, everyone was filled with awe at the signs and the miracles and the crazy stuff taking place. I don't know if we're supposed to take that miracle world seriously or not. In our society, to me, it would be a miracle if somebody sold a car to help pay for somebody else's surgery. That would be a miracle to me today. But when people see that kind of miracle, what else can they do but stand back and go, wow, I didn't think people actually lived this way. Everyone took notice of this church. Everyone was filled with awe. They were saying, wow. And God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Koinonia and growth just go hand in hand. <laughs> How could they not? Along the California coastline, there are some of the largest living organisms in the world. Redwood trees. If you want to see some cool pictures of redwood trees, ask Norm and Rinda. They have some great pictures of them. Uh, the redwoods are 300 feet high. Some of them are 40 feet around. Some of them have been there for 250 or more years. They are truly magnificent sights to see. But do you know why redwoods are able to grow so big? So tall and so big around. The trees are so massive because they're the only 
trees that grow in groves. And their roots intertwine with one another beneath the ground. You see, no intertwining, no growth. No connectedness, no growth. No koinonia, no growth. So this morning, you are invited to be a part of the koinonia of Trinity Baptist Church. Now, even though I said that, that we can't force it to happen, we can't. can't force koinonia to happen. Yeah, your participation is still needed. <laughs> you recognize that. If, you, if nobody's here at all, then there's obviously no fellowship. So on one level, for koinonia to happen, it means that we all need to show up, Right? We need to be around more often at things where there's no people at all. There's no fellowship, obviously. Amy and I were talking about that yesterday while we were driving. Just what a difference it makes. On the Sundays, we have 80 or 85 people in here. Like last Sunday, Mother's Day, we had 85 people here, which is awesome. That, that shows how much we care about our moms. We show up for mama, don't we? <laughs> but when the room is full, there's just... I don't know what it is. There's just something special about those kind of days. So, so on one hand, for koinonia to happen, it means that people need to attend church. <laughs> Join a small group even and devote yourself to it. Devote yourself to the breaking of bread. And when we do those fellowship events, which we're going to do again, we, we are going to do fellowship events again. We're, we're getting there slowly but surely the... Ford brothers have been working in our building down there. If you haven't been down there in a while and seen some of the work, just take a trip down the hall. We'll have fellowship events again, but when we do, devote yourself to it. Devote yourself to prayer. Show up when we host one of those prayer events. You won't have to pray out loud. Nobody's going to laugh at you and say, that was a dumb prayer. Nobody's going to do that. It's between you and the Father, but you're doing it here together with other people. That's what makes it so powerful. Devote yourself to the fellowship of the community and just watch what the Holy Spirit will do in our church. One of the things that I've been uh, working on is a fall schedule for our uh, fall semester, which is a lot of fun for me. I like doing stuff like that, but here's what it's going to mean is that Come the fall, you may start to feel like the remote has a whole lot of buttons on it. <laughs> I told you all at the beginning, pastors are often the most guiltiest of adding in all those buttons. At times, it may seem like our remote is getting pretty full. There will be times when I'm most certain we'll have to do some reevaluating. Is this event really working? Is this small group actually working or not? We may need to cut some buttons. We may need to add some buttons, and the shape of that remote, it just happens in churches, the shape of that remote even start to look a little different over time. But no matter what, no matter how the remote turns out, we're always going to have to hang on to those most important buttons. No matter what, we have to hang on to the most important aspects of the church. The apostles' teaching. Be a learner of the way of Jesus Christ. Orthodoxy should lead to orthoproxy. Devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching. To fellowship. Koinonia. Being together. Breaking bread and holy communion. Praying together. Devote yourself to it. Devote yourself to the right things. Let God worry about the church. <laughs> Devote yourself to the right things. And just watch God take care of His church. Will you pray with me?